So we'll be talking about more kirchhoff helmholtz integral theorem. And we're going to start evaluating it for planar surfaces and point illumination. Um, <clears throat> we're going to set up the KHIT formula based on the derivation we did in the previous lecture. And we'll discuss some applications if we get a chance. Um, this, of course, all is in the service of our unit on physical optics techniques, which is helpful for all sorts of problems. One of the most famous applications is uh, stealth technology. So today we'll learn how to do field extrapolation from surface boundary conditions, and we'll concentrate on planar surfaces with point illumination, either from the backside as a reflective aperture or as a cutout of a screen where you put the source on the opposite side. These wind up being very similar problems to one another. And over here is a picture of a kind of a famous application. This is the F117 uh, stealth fighter. And it looks very unlike any other military aircraft because it involves flat surfaces. And one of the reasons it involves flat surfaces is because this fighter was conceived of in the 1970s when computing resources were much scarcer than they are today. And it was designed with physical optics in mind where analyses would be run on these faceted components to study how they would reflect if illuminated by a radar point source. And you'll see that uh, since this was the very first stealth fighter in an age of impoverished computing resources, it was composed of flat surfaces to make the electromagnetic analysis a little easier. In subsequent years, uh, in subsequent models of stealthy fighters, they get to be more rounded again, more aerodynamic, because the ability to incorporate curved surfaces was um, easier to do at that point. So it's just an interesting piece of side information. So here's the problem that we're going to look at. <clears throat> Let's say we have a half space, that I, and I'm going to denote that as V, volume V. Above a plane, we could say that this is going to ultimately be the XY plane in our analysis. And we're going to solve for fields all up in here. And to know, to do that, we learned from the last lecture that we need to specify the boundary conditions for fields and then apply the Kirchhoff Helmholtz integral theorem to get the solution for E field or H field. Now, looking at this, we find that we're going to solve a general problem where we have a blocking screen <coughs> here and then an aperture A cut out of that screen that allows electromagnetic illumination through to the other side. So we have a point source on this side some area A, some blocking area B that constitutes the rest of the half space that's going to be infinite in all directions, x, y. And then you can think of off at infinity is this third surface C that sort of envelops our entire half space. So it's infinite. And we're going to imply something called Kirchhoff boundary conditions. 
to this problem. Kirchhoff's boundary condition says that the field strength at B should be zero because this is a perfect blocker. And then the field here when the aperture is going to be approximated as whatever the incident current is or uh, incident field e, e sub i with the diamond denoting whatever polarization that we want to specify so we'll be dealing with scalars and let the polarization resolve later <clears throat> and then of course all across c one of the key approximations in electromagnetics that we invoke is that if we take C large enough it's going to be so big and any fields radiating in this medium are going to be so diminished at that point that surely they would have expended and uh, we can basically consider that contribution to be zero. So really it's only across the half plane that we're, or the full plane, the infinite plane here that we need to specify boundary conditions. And the Kirchhoff boundary conditions are going to be incident field in A, zero everywhere else. Now we have to recognize that that is an approximation, along the edge especially, depending on your polarization and the composition of this blocking material. You're going to get some additional currents if this was metal. And they're going to depend on um, the polarization. And then here in A, you'll have some interactions with diffraction along the edge, some secondary and tertiary interactions that will make this idea that you can simply take the incident field and use that to describe the total field across this aperture. That's not going to be exact. The larger A is with respect to a wavelength, the larger this aperture cutout is, the closer that approximates to real life. But we always have to re recognize that there's some stuff going on in the edges of these in real life electromagnetic problems that make the Kirchhoff boundary conditions uh, approximations. So with that in mind, we can formulate our Kirchhoff-Helmholtz integral theorem. Here's the integral theorem repeated, but in this case we're only going to integrate over the aperture on the xy plane, aperture A. We're going to do that over x and y. And the normal component is going to be in the z-hat direction. And this is just repeated from our previous lecture on the Helmholtz, Kirchhoff-Helmholtz integral theorem, noting that the surface field is now going to be this incident field, E sub i. And of course, we need to take the gradient of E sub i as well. So now, Let's take a look. What if there is a source illuminating this? And we have just a point source. We're going to describe this point source as uh, E sub i diamond is going to be equal to some amplitude constant E naught times phase exp minus jk magnitude of r prime minus r naught r naught is going to be the position of that source and r prime is going to be some observation point along this aperture here and i've given it a prime instead of just letting it stand on our own because what we're doing here is saying what is going to be the field that we observe on aperture A that emanates from that point source. And that, in turn, is going to be the input to our Kirchhoff-Helmholtz integral theorem. So it will eventually become <clears throat> a variable of integration. But as you can see here, what we've really done is uh, 
put it in the phase and the amplitude term of this simple point source formula. Now, what if the incident field has this formula uh, and this satisfies this equality, the gradient of that field dotted into z, because ultimately that's the only component that we care about here, our integral formula dotted into z is equal to minus e naught and when I do that gradient formula, I get this formula here. 1 over the magnitude of that distance between the two vectors cubed plus jk magnitude squared of that same distance times the phase term times this r prime minus r naught. So really, I start off with 1 over distance fall off in field when I differentiate. I get a 1 over distance and a 1 over distance squared term. It looks like 1 over distance squared, 1 over distance cubed, but I'm going to need one of these to factor out. To make a unit vector that I can then project onto z hat. And my final result, when I plug this all back in, is going to be here. My field at any given point above the half plane, or above the full plane, I should say, we're going to turn it into a half plane in a little bit, is going to be equal to JK, field amplitude divided by 4 pi, I'm only going to integrate over the surface with respect to x prime and y prime. I've got a phase term. This is due to the phase difference between my point source. Let me draw this. Here's my aperture A. Screen. R naught is my source, point source. R somewhere over on the other plane is my point of observation. This integral is basically going to go through the aperture, add up all of the components, and project them and their contributions over to R. So I'm going to have a phase change in each contribution that's basically equal to the distance from R0 to here, to the aperture, and then from the aperture to R. And I'm going to do that for every single point on that aperture. So I've got to basically slide around in X and Y and pick up all those contributions. And then here's just geometry to get the vectors and the amplitudes to work out. Again, amplitudes from this point to here to here and from this point to here to here all along that aperture. Okay. So, where does that leave us? Well, in the next lecture, we're going to take a look at how to solve that. There are several different regions uh, which involve different layers of approximation. You can try to integrate that numerically, which is not as difficult as it used to be using a computer. And that pretty much allows you to integrate uh, KHIT and solve for fields anywhere that you want. There's another region when you step away. It's not quite the far field, but it's the Fresnel field, or Fresnel's region, that allows you to calculate field strength not exactly up on the aperture but close enough and then there's our more famous Fraunhofer approximation or the true far field region of that aperture that we'll talk about later